skin is a protective covering. It's a mechanical barrier. It also helps us regulate body temperature. When we're hot, we send more blood out to the skin, so the heat will evaporate out of our skin. And when we're cold, we constrict, and we constrict the blood vessels to keep the core nice and warm. It helps retain water because our skin is watertight. We have loads of sensory receptors embedded in our skin. It excretes salt waste as well as urea waste. It makes vitamin D when we're out in the sun, which we're finding vitamin D is really important to our immune function. And it helps protect us against UV rays because the melanin in our skin can absorb the UV rays. Skin or the integument is loaded with all kinds of goodies, which you can see in this cross section here. There's sweat glands, oil glands, hair follicles, um, bunches of sensory receptors for touch, temperature, pain, pressure. We've got connective tis tissue, fat tissue, blood vessels, lots going on inside of our skin. There is three layers to the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous. There's multiple layers in the epidermis, but we're just going to focus on the outermost layer and the innermost layer. The stratum corneum is the outermost layer, so it's about seven cells thick. It's dead keratinized, which is our waterproofing protein tissue, and um, it has died because as the epidermis pushes away from the blood supply, all of the cells die and they slough off and they're continually being replaced. At the base of the epidermis is our stratum basal, and that's the only layer close enough to the blood supply in the dermis that it still has living cells. So all of the other layers of the epidermis are dead or in the process of dying. The stratum basal has melanin pigments to absorb UV light. Here you can see the five different layers of the epidermis, but again, we're just going to look at the stratum corneum, the outermost layer, and the stratum basal, the base layer. And you can see there's a color difference as you move through the layers because of the pigmentation that's there. Your epidermis is thickest on the palms and the soles of your feet. It does contain a layer of melanocyte cells that provide the melanin in the stratum basal. Here in this dark layer of melanocytes, you can see the melanin forming. That's our protective layer from the sun. The melanocyte cells down here in the stratum basal have sort of these arm-like extensions that weave up through the other layers of the epidermal cells, and they transfer the pigment granules up through the layers to help protect the other layers of the skin. And the pigment granules are what are absorbing that UV light. Several things affect the color of our skin. One is our genetics, because that affects not only how much melanin we have, but also the size of the granules of our pigment molecules. Um, albinos completely lack melanin, so they have no protection from UV light. Our physiological factors, like whether our blood vessels are dilated. So some people, when they get embarrassed, their cheeks get flushed and red, and that's because blood is going to the surface of the skin. The constriction of the dermal blood vessels, so when we're super cold and trying to conserve heat, you know, our fingers and can turn blue, and our uh, lips might turn blue. Some of the things we eat, like if we eat a lot of tomatoes or carrots, they have carotene pigment in them, and that can turn us kind of a yellowish orange color. If our liver's not working right, jaundice can um, make us look yellow with the liver releasing bile pigments into the blood. And then we're all aware of how the amount of sunlight we get affects our coloring in our skin. And even though we might find that we look nice when we're nice and brown and tan from sunlight or from UV light, any of that pigmentation darkening is telling us damage has happened because that's why we make those pigment granules is to protect us from sun damage. So when we're getting tanner and darker, that tells you you've, your skin's been damaged. So your skin's trying to protect itself from future damage. That's why it makes itself dark. Okay, so we were looking at the top layer, the epidermis. We're going to look now at what's going on inside the dermis. So the epidermis was just, you know, 
several cells thick. And the dermis, although it's larger, is still not very dense, thick tissue. It's only one to two millimeters thick. There's a lot of connective tissue in it. Like I said before, there's muscle cells, there's nerve cells, there's blood vessels, hair follicles, glands. There's lots of stuff packed into that two millimeters. So inside the dermis, you have your hair follicles, and we have this little muscle right here attached to the base of the hair follicle, so let's talk about those. Hair is skin. The epidermal cells of the hair grow at the base of the hair follicle, so hair is only growing from the follicle. Once it's out of your scalp, that's all dead tissue, so the living cells are at the very base of the hair follicle. As those cells grow away from the blood supply again, they become more keratinized and then they die. So it's okay to, you know, get a haircut. doesn't hurt because all that is is dead tissue at that point. We have hair everywhere but our lips, our soles, our palms, and our nipples. So down here at the base of the hair follicle is where the living tissue is. That's where cell division or mitosis is happening. Once we're up here at this darker keratinized point, it's all dead tissue at that point. We can, you know, pluck a hair out of our skin, like our eyebrows, we pluck them out. And over time, we can do damage to this hair follicle down here. And at some point, that hair may stop growing because of the damage of pulling on that follicle all the time. And that's how the um, electrolysis type techniques work for helping create permanent hair loss. We're sort of frying with electricity that hair follicle so that cell division will stop down there. This is a microscopic image of the hair follicle. So again, here's the base and the living part of the tissue, the root. Several structures are um, around that hair follicle. One is the electric erector pili muscle, which is attached at the base of the hair follicle and it pulls on that hair follicle. So that can make your hair stand on end or stand up. And in our case, since we're not that hairy anymore, really what happens is we get goosebumps. It's not really effective at making our hair stand up. But on animals, hairy animals like your dog and your cat, when those little erector pili muscles pull, their hair does stand up, and that can do two things for them. When it stands up on the scruff of their neck, it makes them look bigger and scarier. And when it stands up all over their body, it kind of creates a bigger distance between them and the cold air. So it kind of fluffs up their hair and separates their, the cold air from their skin a little bit more. Hair follicles also have a sebaceous gland that surrounds them and dumps oil onto them. And that oil oozes up along the shaft of the hair follicle. And it, it's, you know, softening that hair, making it pliable helps keep it waterproof. Sometimes these glands become overactive, usually in response to male hormones or androgens, which you know happen more at puberty. And then those glands become overactive and they make too much more oil and that makes um, nice breeding ground for bacteria to grow. Bacteria love to eat that oil. And then we get an infection, we get pimples or zits. Right here is that oil gland, which again is softening the hair follicle. And then that oil oozes all the way up to the surface of the skin and helps make your skin soft and pliable and not crack. We don't want cracks in our skin because then our mechanical protection is gone. Sweat glands occur everywhere in our skin, but they're mostly in our palms and soles our armpits, and in our groin area. And we have two different types of sweat glands. The apocrine glands are um, stimulated more when we kick into sympathetic mode and we're stressed out and we're sweating because we're nervous, like say you went on a job interview and you're sweating a bunch then. And then our eccrine glands are more associated with us trying to cool our body. So we're evaporating off water. And, um, and that then we see usually you know, people when they're exercising and their neck and back and armpits get really sweaty, but that's a cooling type of a thing that we're doing, not a stress. 
Sweat is a way for us to release waste. So it looks a lot like urine. It's got salt and urea and uric acids and water in it. We do have a couple of other glands in our skin. The ceruminous glands are only found in our ears and they produce ear wax. Mammary glands that make milk, which men and women both have, by the way. Our nails, our fingernails, toenails, are keratinized. Remember that waterproof protein? It's keratin. It's a keratinized skin tissue, but this is harder and stronger, more keratin than in, in say, our hair or our skin. The nail itself is like our hair follicle in that it only grows from the base, and we call that base the lunula because it looks like a half moon. And if you look all the way down by your cuticle, and maybe you have to push your cuticle back a little bit, you'll see a white half moon down there, and that's where your new nail is growing from. And then everything else is dead tissue again. So that's why you can clip your nails and not have it kill you. When you do pull off a nail and it hurts, the reason it's hurting is it, it's pulling on the skin that's underneath your nail and attached to your nail. The nail itself has no sensory receptors in it. Here you can see that lunula, and that's where the nail is growing from. Okay, this last layer here, the subcutaneous layer, is loose connective tissue, which includes adipose or fat tissue. And that fat tissue is an insulative layer. It's to help us hold body heat in, help keep us warm. As we put on weight, that subcutaneous layer can get thicker and thicker and thicker with fat cells. And, um, and then that creates more insulation. So people that are overweight have a harder time getting rid of body heat. So during the summer when it's super hot and we want to cool ourselves, they can really struggle with getting that body heat out of their bodies because they have so much insulation. So if a thin person is outside and it's, you know, 85 degrees, they might be reasonably reasonably comfortable, but somebody that is maybe 75 pounds overweight might be out there at that same temperature and feeling really miserably hot. So skin helps us regulate our body temperature. So the hypothalamus has, you know, a set point. We're supposed to be around 98.6 degrees and if we get outside of that, the hypothalamus sets some things into action. So one thing that would happen is our dermal blood vessels would dilate to carry that heat to the surface of the skin so it'll radiate out to the environment. And then our sweat glands are also activated so that we can release moisture onto the surface of the skin and then the evaporation of that moisture will carry away heat. And then that should help cool our body temperature back down to normal. So in the opposite scenario, when we get too cold, Again, our hypothalamus will recognize that, and it's going to send message out to our effectors, our dermal blood vessel again, and in this case, it's going to constrict the blood vessels to our skin because we don't want to lose body heat out to the skin. Our sweat glands will be told to stay inactive. Our muscles will be told to contract or spasm. Muscles generate a lot of heat when they're working, so we we want to generate heat, so making our muscles contract will cause us to generate heat. And that's why you get, you know, the shivers when you're super cold. We're trying to get those muscles doing something so they'll create heat for the body. If you have hyperthermia, then you have abnormally high body temperature. And I'm sure you've all had hyperthermia because probably all of you have had a fever at some point. Hypothermia is when our body temperature has dropped too much. We're out in the cold and we're um, losing heat too rapidly. We can't keep ourselves warm. Our body temperature may drop down to 97, 96 degrees. Most of us have experienced burns of some sort, maybe um, from a hot pan or curling iron or the sun. So a first degree burn is a very superficial burn. Um, through the epidermis, maybe the very top of the dermis, and your skin just turns red. In a second degree burn, your skin is actually blistering. 
So that's when you know you have a second degree burn. And those blisters um, will pop and that skin will peel and shed and you'll grow new skin underneath. A third degree burn, you're burning all the way through the dermis. And then the skin can't replace itself. And what will happen is connective tissue will come in. And that's where you get those nasty, gnarled looking scars because that's no longer dermis tissue. That's just connective tissue trying to cover up a wound that's there. So when somebody's had a very bad burn, like from a fire, um, we have to, if we want to heal that tissue and not have it just be uh, scarred connective tissue, we need to replace their skin. And we can do a graft. We can take skin from a cadaver and replace their burnt skin. We can stretch their skin out and parts of their body. Um, take swatches of you know thigh skin or belly skin and move that to another part of their body. And that will help eliminate some of those really nasty connective tissue scars. When you have a cut or a scrape of your dermis, um, it's going to heal very similarly to how we talked about a blood clot forming in an injury. So the blood vessels are going to break, the blood will go through extrinsic clotting, the platelets will collect, the blood cells will collect in that area and will get that sticky scab um, hardening of the blood there and that will protect that wound site as new tissue, which we can see in these later pictures in F and G, new tissue will start to form underneath that scab and eventually push that scab towards the surface and it'll get sloughed off.